Our topic tonight is actually a really interesting one, and that is on, and it's looking at what's happening in the in the world around us, and trying to work out what the future of our planet is. As Dan said, we're going to do things a little bit differently tonight. What I want to do is have a bit of a review of the year 2020, and then we'll pause. We're going to then read our reading from Daniel chapter 12, because I hope that by the end of the first section, we will have Daniel given, be able to give Daniel 12 a little bit of context, and then we're going to delve into some Bible prophecy and see what the Bible has to say about the events that are happening in the world. Now, I need to say at the outset, I am not a Republican. I am not a Democrat. In fact, I don't have any, as a Christadelphian, I don't have any political allegiance whatsoever. So tonight we're going to be talking about different nations in the world. Okay, and we're going to be looking at them, though, in the context of what the Bible says. It's really important that we understand that the hope that the Bible offers us is available to everybody, no matter what nationality we are, which is good for you Australians, because I'm a New Zealander, so we're fine. Okay, but Australians, Canadians, Americans, it doesn't matter where we come from. We have no choice what nationality we are born through, but we do have a choice as to whether or not we accept the hope that God offers us. It's really important because tonight we're going to actually be talking about America. We're going to be talking about countries like Russia. Um, but we're going to be talking about them in the context of what the Bible says. We're going to be talking about the nation of Iran as well. Now, the first part of our, our session tonight may seem to be quite negative. So I want to put some context around it and ask you a question. And the question is, is there a purpose to our existence? Or do we just happen to live on the earth purely by chance? And the answer is, according to the Bible, that yes, there is a purpose or a reason why we exist and why the earth that we live on also exists. The prophet Isaiah in chapter 45 and verse 18 says, and this is God talking, he's laying down the challenge to the idols or to the gods of the other nations, he says, Thus says the Lord God that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. And this is really important that we understand this because there are people who believe that the earth is ultimately plunging headlong to its own destruction, and one day it will, it will either blow up or burn up. But God says, no, I have actually created the earth. I didn't do it just because I had some spare time. I created it for a purpose. There is a reason behind your existence. I created the earth that we live on to be inhabited, not to be destroyed. These same sentiments are taken up by the Lord Jesus Christ in his prayer in Matthew chapter 6 and verses 9 and 10. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. I'm not sure that we can say today that we live in a world where God's will in heaven is done on earth. In fact, far from it. When we look at the world around us today, it's a bit like looking into grandma's vegetable soup and trying to cast all the veggies to one side and take the good stuff out of it and work out exactly what is happening. So I guess if I said to you what happened in 2020, the resounding answer would be what? What was the big event of 2020? Jude. Sorry? COVID-19. Absolutely, the COVID crisis. But you know what? Before the COVID crisis, the world nearly went to war. I want to take us back to January of last year. In January of last year, President Donald Trump of the United States did something that no other president before him had ever done. He ordered his armed forces to kill a chap called Qasim Soliam. General Qasim Soliam is the was the chief 
or Principal General of the Iranian Armed Forces. And President Trump wanted him dead. Previous presidents hadn't even gone down this path because they considered the potential outcomes and ramifications to be too dangerous. And this is a part of the ongoing Iran-US crisis that has been brewing for a number of years. But the US, we assume, killed General Soliam, and I Iran retaliated by destroying buildings in Iraq that were housing US troops. So we have tit and we have tat. President Trump then says there will be ramifications for this. And fortunately, they ended up being diplomatic sanctions rather than military. But if you look at all the different newspapers and commentators, they say the world was so close to war at the time that it was ultimately very, very scary. What was happening in Australia at that time? Well, we had the worst bushfire season on record. It's hard to think with such a cool, mild summer this year, to think back 12 months ago and think about the fires in New South Wales and Victoria in particular. In that time, 22 people died directly as a result of the fires, plus many more indirectly. 3,100 homes were destroyed, 17 million hectares of land burned, that's 6.7% of the land mass of New South Wales was destroyed by fire, including 37% of their national parks. And many species and animals and plants have become either endangered or extinct as a result of those fires in Australia. Well, time is ticking on, but we still haven't got to COVID-19. In February last year, or January, the end of January, President Donald Trump faced impeachment proceedings. And this was over his dealings with the Ukraine. Yes, ultimately he was cleared, but he is only the third president in 150 years to face impeachment proceedings. Well, he has recently upped that record, hasn't he? Because in January 2021, he is now facing impeachment proceedings yet again, but this time for inciting rioting and insurrection uh, due to the recent election saga that's playing out before us at the moment in the United States. So this is an unprecedented situation to have an American president, the president of one of the most powerful nations on earth, being impeached twice in 12 months. We still haven't got to COVID. Let's move to the UK. We might have forgotten about this. The actress Meghan Markle married to Prince Harry. And one would assume that by marrying into the royal family, you would accept that royal life was part of your newfound life. But no, not Meghan. She's had enough. She wants out and Harry wants out as well. So the establishment, the monarchy of the UK is thrown into turmoil when Prince Harry and Meghan Markle say they've had enough of life as royals and they want to spend six months of the year in the US, six months of the year in the UK, and at the same time, thanks, we'll take mum's millions at the same time. Well, unfortunately, Grandma said, no, no, Harry, this is not how it works. Okay, but that's destabilised, really, the royal family of the UK. And then March 2020, the COVID crisis that we're all living through, the global pandemic, as we call it. 94 million people have contracted COVID-19, it's estimated. In the US alone, 23.6 million cases with nearly 400,000 deaths. So the most advanced nation in the world with seemingly one of the best medical systems in the world, has got had 23.6 million people contract COVID-19 and they can't cope with it. It's interesting, they say that one of the reasons that America has such a high incidence rate is because it's the great land of freedom. So it's built, America is built as being the great land of freedom, and that means, who are you to tell me what to do? So when I say to you, socially distance, 
wear a mask, you say, no, it's my right to do as I please. And even Donald Trump seems to deny the existence of coronavirus, even though the fact he contracted it. The UK has recorded 3.5 million cases with 87,000 deaths. So again, very high statistics. Our lives here have been affected, haven't it? But not nearly to the same effect as other countries in the world. And that is something that we can be really, really thankful for. So what's the future of COVID-19? Well, vaccines are being produced and distributed and rolled out across the world. But as the vaccines are being produced and distributed, authorities are becoming concernedly concerned by mutant varieties known as the South African and UK variants. And these apparently are variants that seem to spread faster, that mutate in different ways to the original virus. And this is the new worry for our medical authorities. Of course, with these sorts of things also comes economic consequences. It's interesting, we we're having a, a discussion at lunch and I said I was listening to an investment banker at the start of last year and he said the great industry to invest in the next 10 years is global airlines because as, as the middle class of China and India rises, they're going to want to travel more. And 12 months later, global air travel has all but ceased. Really hard to believe, isn't it? On March the 9th, the Dow Jones or the US share market suffered its greatest ever one day plunge over concerns about the coronavirus. Governments all around the world have been printing money to keep their economies afloat. There's only so much money that you can print before things start to go belly up. We don't know how this is going to play out. Rising unemployment as countries go into lockdown and recession. Demand for oil has dropped and petrol prices have slumped. Who can remember the last time we paid 90 cents a litre for petrol in Australia? It was about 2000, I think. When I first moved here, I remember petrol prices being about 89 to 90 cents a litre. 20 years later, they're back down to that price, depending on what day you go to top up with petrol. Some days they're up to $1.64, usually the next day. Just as we have been encouraged to socially, socially isolate and to distance ourselves, we have the Black Lives Matters protests primarily in the United States. And this is over the police brutality and the killing of a man called George Floyd, which has um, inflamed racial tension in many different countries, including the UK. We've had riots, or more protests here in Australia rather than riots, thankfully. Okay, so that's another thing that's, been, that's boiling away in the background. We move over to Lebanon. Lebanon in Syria is being had civil war and war brewing for years and years and years. And in August last year, there was a massive explosion in Beirut, which apparently could be felt as far, as far away as Cyprus. That's 175 kilometers away. It was thought to be a, at first to be a terrorist event or a military event, but it was found out to be um, ammonia nitrate which would have been stored in a shed, exploding. But it killed 200 people, it injured thousands more, and destroyed some $15 billion worth of infrastructure. We're talking about in a country which has already been brought to its knees by ongoing war. 300,000 people left homeless. These are staggering, staggering figures. As we said, Lebanon's economy was already in crisis due to the effects of war and also the impact of COVID-19. What else has happened last year? It's been quite an eventful year. August 2020, the American wildfire season. This time it was California's turn to have their, have their worst ever fire season. Four million acres of land was burnt in California. That was just the same amount of land that had been burnt in the three previous seasons all joined together. 
So these are huge bushfires. 10,500 homes destroyed, 31 people killed as a direct result of the fires. And five of the six largest fires on record were recorded last year in California. These were catastrophic events impacting the lives of everyday people. On a national basis, the American elections of 2020, the stolen election, as Mr. Trump calls it, when he had the results stolen from him. We've seen the saga and the fiasco rolling out across our screens, across our newspapers, between Mr. Biden and Mr. Trump, where Donald Trump is sure that the election system has been rigged to remove him as president. What do we make of all these events? And in particular, how do they relate to Bible prophecy? Well, the honest answer is, is that if we're, we're going to look for a chapter and a verse in the Bible that predicted all these events happening, we can't actually find a specific prophecy. But what we're going to find tonight is that the Bible predicts that the world is going to become a very unstable place prior to Jesus Christ's return. This is not how mankind sees it. As we got to the end of 2020, everyone was saying, well, when the calendar turns over to 2021, 2021 will be better than 2020. Really? So six days into 2021, and we have the riots in the US Capitol building, and it was stormed by protesters. We've all seen the results of this in our media. What was this in response to? This was in response to Donald Trump calling his supporters to arms in support of the stolen election victory. President Trump, in his rallying speech, told them to fight like hell to take our country back. And then he says, I don't understand why it descended into chaos and violence. So three days later, he stands up and says, I don't condone the violence that occurred in these peaceful protests. And he doesn't understand why all this happened. We're going to pause for a moment, and I'm going to ask Dan to come forward and to read for us from the Bible from Daniel chapter 12. The prophecy of Daniel is a really interesting one. So Daniel was a prophet of God. He lived in the nation of Babylon. He was a Jew, and God gave numerous visions and prophecies to Daniel regarding the future of the earth. And Daniel chapter 12, we're getting right to the end of Daniel's life, and he wants to know what the future is going to hold. So Dan, do you mind coming forward, please, and reading for us Daniel chapter 12. Daniel 12. <clears throat> And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was, there was a nation even to the same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake, some to everlasting life and some to shame. And everlasting contempt and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever but thou O Daniel shut up the words and seal the book even to the times of the end many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased then I Daniel looked and behold there stood two other, the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one of the men clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, said, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth for ever and ever, that shall be for a time, times and a half. And when he shall accomplish to scatter the powers of the holy people, all things shall be finished. And I heard 
but I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? He said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. But go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Thanks, Dan. Okay, so that chapter from Daniel chapter 12. In Daniel chapter 12, Daniel, the man Daniel is getting to the end of his life. He's been given some really great visions by God and some explanations and prophecies regarding the future of the earth. And in Daniel chapter 11, which we're not going to look at tonight, it's quite a major prophecy regarding what we might call the times of the end, or the days just before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Daniel chapter 12, you notice there in verse 1, it says that at this time, and it's referring to the events of Daniel chapter 11, there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. What this is saying is that we can expect, based on Bible prophecy, for events in the world to deteriorate prior to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at this in a little bit more detail in a moment. But the good news is that God has a plan and a purpose for the earth and the people who live on it. And so he talks here in Daniel about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. He says at that time there will be a resurrection and those people who are faithful to God will live forever and ever. So what we just considered in the last 10-15 minutes were some of the events that happened in 2020 in the world around us. As we say, there is nothing specific in any Bible prophecy that specifically talks about these events. But there are also a couple of other things that happened in 2020 that probably for the majority of the world around us, they didn't even really take much notice or they appeared to be of very, very little consequence. The first one was in July 2020. Now this picture here is of the Haga Hagia Sophia, which is a mosque in Turkey. Up until July last year, the Hagia Sophia was a museum. And it's been like that since 1931. Turkey has a pro-Muslim government, and they have turned this museum back into a mosque for worship, and it's caused huge division in the nation of Turkey. Well, not only in Turkey, but in different parts of the world. Reason being, well, the Hagia Sophia was originally built as a Byzantine church in the 6th century, so that's, what, 1400 years ago. Uh, back in the 13th century, it was a Catholic church, and it was converted into a mosque in 1453 and then in 1931 it was converted into a museum by a secular government in Turkey and last year it's now become a mosque again. This is interesting potentially because Turkey is one of the nations that we're going to look at tonight in some of the prophecies that we look at particularly from Ezekiel 38 and this may give us a clue as to why the nation of Turkey is to be invaded 
at the time of the end according to Bible prophecy. Another event or two events that happened in 2020 were the involvement of President Trump in peace deals between the Israelis and the Arabs. Now for all the carnage and chaos that the, uh, the reign of President Trump has caused in the United States of America, there's a couple of really interesting things as far as Bible prophecy is concerned that he did last year. So here he is with the leaders of various nation, Arab nations and also the President of Israel. See, one of the things that the Bible predicts is that the nation of Israel is going to be needing to live in peace and security prior to Jesus Christ's return. And the existence of the modern state of Israel has been anything but peaceful or secure in the last 70 years. In fact, it has been quite the opposite. So these peace deals given the fact that they are probably based on military or economic relationships rather than biblical or religious principles, that's sort of putting things to one side, have been brokered by President Trump and his Jewish son-in-law. And as we say, that's potentially very interesting because the nation of Israel has to live in peace and security prior to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's one thing that we can expect. And so those of us who uh, have an interest in Bible prophecy, I think these events in particular in 2020 are really something that's of great interest to us. One thing that we do have to be really careful is that we don't take what's happening in the news and try and squeeze it into Bible prophecy. Often Bible prophecy is interpreted with the benefit of history. We look back and say that event there lines up with what the Bible predicted. That is the fulfillment of that particular prophecy because events come and go. For example, coronavirus, it may or it may not have any relevance to Bible prophecy. We may not know. They may find a vaccine, the thing may die down, and life may go on. But only time will tell. But talking about coronavirus, let's turn to the Gospel of Luke in the New Testament into Luke 21. The Lord Jesus Christ gave a prophecy. Parts of it were quite detailed. Parts of it are not quite so detailed. And a bit more open possibly to interpretation. And I'll explain to you what I mean by that in a minute. So in Luke chapter 21, Jesus is, is talking to his disciples and he says, the time is going to come when the city of Jerusalem was going to be invaded by the Roman armies and totally destroyed. And he says, when you see these things starting to happen, get out of Jerusalem and run for your lives because destruction is coming. And we know from AD 70, from history, that, that is exactly what happened. But in verse 24, Jesus gives a very interesting prophecy. He says, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So he says, What's going to happen is the city of Jerusalem is going to be destroyed by a Gentile or a non-Jewish army. The city is going to be totally flattened. The people are going to be led away captive. And Jerusalem is going to be in control of, Jew of Gentile nations until a certain point in time when it's restored to the Jewish people again. That is a fascinating prophecy, because in 1967, that's exactly what happened. The Jewish people took control again of the city of Jerusalem. What this means is that we are now living on borrowed time. 
because this part of the prophecy has been fulfilled and the rest of the prophecy is yet to be fulfilled. So Jesus says that will happen and he says then this is the next part in verse 25. He says there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity the sea and the waves roaring and this is not talking about global warming this is talking about nations okay and he says there is a time coming on the earth when the nations will be in distress and the events that they are facing are so complicated they actually have no way to resolve them verse 26 men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken now what are the sun moon and stars that jesus is referring to because there are some people who believe that jesus is prophesying the total destruction of the earth that we live on and yet we're seeing from Isaiah that God created the earth for a purpose so if we believe that God created the earth for a purpose we can't believe that God created the earth to be destroyed well the answer is found for us in the Old Testament because often in prophecy it uses symbols to mean things so it's not always talking about literal things. So it's not here talking about a literal sun, a literal moon, or literal stars. These are symbols. Come back with me, if you will, to the prophet Isaiah and chapter 1. Isaiah, so Jesus actually in Luke 21, he quotes or alludes a lot to Isaiah the prophet. And Isaiah, in chapter 1, he uses very similar language. He says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. Now, how can the, how can the heavens and the earth literally hear? And the answer is, well, he's not talking to the literal heavens and the literal earth. Let's have a look at verse 10. Very, very similar language. Listen to this. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom, and give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. So if we look at verses 1, at verse 2 and verse 10, and we line them up together, we find that heavens and rulers are parallels. And earth and people are parallels. And that's really interesting because we come back to Luke 21. And what does Jesus say? He said there'll be signs in the sun, moon, and the stars, the sea and the waves roaring. Okay, so the sea and the waves are another symbol for people who live on the earth. He says there's going to be a time coming of chaos when mankind doesn't know what to do, and there'll be turmoil in the leaders of the nations. In fact, kids, what's the first time in the Bible that we find out that sun, moon, and stars refer to ruling people? Does anyone know? There's a man who had a dream Jemima. Joseph. Joseph, okay. So remember Joseph, he had this dream, didn't he? And he, he goes to his dad and his brothers the next morning and says, I had a dream last night. There were 12 stars, a sun and a moon. And the sun, moon and stars all bowed down to my star. This is my dream. And his dad said, are I, my mother and your brothers going to bow down to you? Okay, so sun was dad, moon was mum, ruling powers. Okay, so this is actually symbols that the Bible uses right back from the start of the Bible. And all through the Bible, it's entirely consistent with this message. 
So given that there is going to be turmoil in the nations, what then do we expect to happen in Bible prophecy? Well, God actually has a plan. The turmoil that we're starting to see and that we expect to see is actually God fulfilling his plan with the earth. And God's plan is ultimately to bring all nations to the city of Jerusalem for a global battle. Okay? And we've taken four quotes here to, to prove our point. So Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. So all the nations are going to be drawn to the city of Jerusalem for battle, and they are going to be after something. They're going to be after this thing called a spoil. And we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail in a moment. In Ezekiel chapter 38, which is a quite detailed chapter about the invasion of the city of Jerusalem or the nation of Israel, it talks about the invading army and the thoughts that they're going to have in their mind. And the, the thoughts in this, the mind of this invading army is that we will go up to a land of unwalled villages. So that has to be a nation that is living in peace. And I'll go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates to take a spoil and to take a prey. So we look at Zechariah 14 verses 1 and 2 and Ezekiel 38 verse 11 to 12 and we find very similar sort of ideas. Nations coming to Jerusalem to take a prey and a spoil. Joel, the prophet Joel, parallels these sort of sentiments in his writings as well. He says, I will gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, which is just outside the city of Jerusalem. Proclaim you this among the Gentiles, prepare war, wake up your mighty men. What we find is that we can actually parallel Ezekiel 38, Zechariah 14, and Joel 3 together, and they have very, very similar thoughts, ideas, and phrases. And so those three chapters, if we put them all together, we get a lot of detail about what is going to happen. Now, maybe this is just an Old Testament idea, but no, it's not, because in Revelation chapter 16 and verse 16, it says that God gathered them into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. So Revelation also talks about this great battle that is going to occur in the future. So this is God's ultimate plan. This is what God, he's got in plan. And we're going to find out why God has um, this plan in place. He doesn't have it in place to destroy the earth. But I'm going to say to you now that no matter what nationality you are tonight, where we come from, I don't think any of the nations of the world are actually going to come out of this smelling particularly nice. Okay, so the Bible does mention some nations in particular, other nations it alludes to, but it doesn't mention them. But ultimately, what we need to remember is it doesn't matter where we're born, the hope of the gospel is available to everybody. So bearing this in mind, what do we expect as Bible students? Well, there's a couple of interesting things. So we've talked about the peace deals that President Trump has brokered. Now, I don't know what the motive is for these peace deals being broke, brokered, but all I know is that if I turn to the book of Ezekiel and chapter 38, we have to have Israel living in peace and security. And that's quite a common theme that comes out of Ezekiel 38. That this invading army that comes against the nation of Israel and Jerusalem comes against a nation that is living in peace and security and that are dwelling safely. So, so to do that, the Jewish people have to be at peace with the surrounding nations. What we also know is that there are two opposing forces in this great battle. 
Okay? And so what we can expect to see, we're actually, let's read from uh, verse 1 of Ezekiel 38. So open your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 38. And we're going to read from verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thy army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armour, even a great company, with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Goma and his bands, the house of Tagama of the north quarters, and all his bands and many people with him. Okay, so that's one part of the picture. There is also a second alliance of nations. And these are found for us in verse 13. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, all of the young lions thereof shall come unto thee and say, Art thou come to take a spoil? Art thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, and to take a great spoil? Now, I'm not going to sit here and prove to you tonight uh, who these nations are. Okay, that can be an exercise if you're interested that you might want to do in your own time. But I'm going to suggest to you that if we go and we look at other translations of the Bible, if we look at history, if we look at encyclopedias, that these nations here mentioned in verses 2 and 3 of Ezekiel 38 are talking about Western European nations all to the north and to the west of Israel. Okay? So we're talking about Russia, we're talking about Germany, we're talking about France and those nations. And they are going to be ultimately come together. And we don't know how this is all going to happen because at the moment there's not a lot of love between Germany and France and there's not a lot of love between Germany, France and Russia. So something has to happen in the future to trigger these nations to form an alliance to come against the land of Israel. And where do they come down? They come down through the land of Tagama or through the land of Turkey in the way into the, into the Middle East. That's one thing that is interesting in the moment is that Russia has significant armed forces in Syria, which is just to the north of Israel. And she's recently signed some quite serious agreements to build naval ports in the Mediterranean. Why? Maybe this is God's plan, part of God's plan unfolding for Russia to come down into the Middle East with her allied nations. Okay? What's also important is that Israel has made peace with nations such as Sheba and Dedan, the Arabs, and they will supply refuge and safety to the Jewish people in the time of this great battle. Now, why is this battle going to take place? Why is God allowing it to take place? Well, it's not ultimately so that because God delights in destruction and death and chaos. There is actually a grander plan and purpose. And this is where we can be part of it if we accept the offer that God has made to us. So God's ultimate plan is one day to have this earth filled with people who love him and who reflect his character or his personality what's going to be the ultimate outcome so let's go back to these four chapters that we've we've had a look at so Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 9 says that ultimately God's plan with this battle is that one day he will be king over all the earth and that day there will be one Lord and his name one okay so at the moment we live in a world where there are rulers of all different nations of all different political uh, backgrounds of all different ideologies, but ultimately God's plan and purpose is to hit that he will be king 
over all the earth. Ezekiel 38 verse 23. I will be known in the eyes of many nations and they shall know that I am God. Okay, I can tell you now if Jesus Christ came back today, I can't see some of the rulers of the nations just meekly bowing over and saying, that's fine, you come in, you take over. Uh -uh. And so God ultimately has to bring these nations to their feet. Joel chapter 3, which we've already looked at. You shall know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain, and then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her anymore. And then Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15, which is a final vision of the kingdoms of this world becoming the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Okay, well, I hope you have found that interesting. Um, I think the important thing that we can take away tonight is that God has an, a plan and a purpose with the, the earth. There is, there is hope coming. We don't know what the ride's going to be like, but we need to live by faith and know that ultimately God is in control.